Hello everybody, so it's Jeff again, and uh, I am continuing on with the work that we were doing toward assignment one in our first live coding session here. Um, so, I guess, for anything else, it wouldn't hurt to take a quick look at where we're at. So, as we left off, um, we have a program that prints out a header and one row of our table to the console and then we do the same thing to a file um, and when we run this get this so we're printing out the force is 500 newtons acceleration velocity and position are all zero because we haven't really done any work toward defining our body or vector yet and so that's going to be sort of the big topic of the day here is uh, going through body and vector classes and um, getting them planned out a little bit more. Uh, I'm going to leave a lot of the sort of details of like the exact lines of code for particular functions for you to write, but um, I'm going to stub out all of those functions and show you how you need to go about writing that in your .h and .cpp files. And um, inside those CPP files, I'll put down some comments so that, you know, you have a basic idea what each of these things are supposed to do. And uh, that should leave you in a pretty good position to, uh, to continue on the work and get done what needs to be done. So, uh, if you'll recall, uh, we had a body class which consists of a mass acceleration velocity and a position and of course uh, the acceleration velocity and position are all gd vec 2s um, so now gd vec 2 is probably the least defined class that we have it's um very very minimal at the moment what we've done toward this we only have a double x and a double y and a very basic constructor which uh, if we look at the definition for that constructor simply sets x and y to zero when a new vector gets created so this is very bare bones it's very simple um but uh if you recall <clears throat> from the assignment one uh, sheet here uh, there are quite a few functions here that are um, that are being presented to you as things to build um, and some of these are more complicated than others uh, I'm gonna take a look at a few of these first um, before I go on to do um, before I go on to look at these specifically uh, these ones that take the form of void operator or gdvec2 operator, uh, these are what is known as operator overloads. And in C++, uh, technically also in C Sharp, uh, but in many programming languages, you have the capability to override how operators work on uh, your types. And in C++, for example, um, we have the ability to define what it means to use the plus sign between um, two vectors or what it means to use my variable name plus equals some value. Um, it is possible for us to tell C++ what those things mean so that when we use them uh, it just understands how to complete those operations properly. And we're going to use that in a few cases here because it's actually very powerful and very useful with vectors. Um, and it makes them a lot more convenient to work with. That being said, uh, operator overloading uh, can be very confusing if you use it weirdly. So, um, you know, we'll dive into that, but that's, that's an important thing to discuss. Uh, we'll, we'll make sure that we're using it in a way that... Uh, is as, least, as little confusing as possible. So I'm going to start off um, in my gdvec2.h and I'm actually just going to add a bunch of stuff to it and honestly I copy and paste like a lot of stuff like a lot of stuff and um, what I'm going to do here actually is I am just going to 
copy and paste a whole whack of stuff here. So I've dumped in a whole bunch of things um, and I'm just going to make sure these are all sort of like formatted correctly and I'll make sure that they are um, syntactically correct. I want to reorder them a little bit, but otherwise... Okay, so what do we got? Okay, so we have these operator overloads. I'm going to bring these things up here because these things kind of all belong together. And let's sort of vaguely make them alphabetical. Not that it really matters, but it's kind of nice that they are. Sure. Let me capitalize a few things because I like my comments pretty. Uh, yeah, sure. And let's just uh, let's just space these out a tiny bit so that Sure. All right. Um, that feels pretty good. Um, got a couple more semicolons here. Sure. All right. That's feeling better. Okay. So uh, yeah. So basically, all I did there was I just grabbed this whole chunk of information here and just like literally dropped it into my. Uh, into my code in my .h file and just started hacking away on it to uh, to turn it into legit code, which mostly meant adding semicolons. That's, that's mostly what I ended up doing here. So there's a lot of functions here. And um, for those of you who are new to C++, um, possibly the thing that's jumping out at you here is that there's a quite a lot of const. There's a lot of const. Um, and uh, yes, uh, those who use C++ frequently um, will very highly value using const in various ways, but um, it can mean a lot of different things in a lot of different places, and it will take some getting used to. Um, regarding what it means in different places. Uh, to begin with, in your programs, you can probably omit using it without any problems. However, uh, as you become more advanced with C++, you'll want to use it more heavily. Anyhow, so what's going on here is we've got uh, a function to do a dot product, and what we want to pass to it is uh, what's called so we, we're passing it a gdvec2 and this ampersand means pass it a reference to a gdvec2 I'm sure that you're going to be learning about references in your first couple of weeks in C++ but the idea is that we don't want to pass it the whole gdvec2 we just want to pass it the address to one and use it as though we had passed the whole thing like it lets us use the dot syntax that you're used to to call functions on the thing or to access its properties and those sorts of things the const here means when we pass this into the dot product function i never want to let this this vector be changed for any reason and c lets us safeguard our code that way by saying well this vector's in here to produce a dot product if you change something about this vector in here you did it wrong so don't do that like so statements like const here are mostly there to help us protect ourselves against um, mistakes that usually our future selves or our coworkers might make if they don't know what we know um, this second use of const that you see here this this const at the end of a function definition is there to say that this dot product function will never modify the x and y properties belonging to this vector. 
Now, again, if I wrote this like this, the dot product function can be made to do exactly the same thing that, that it would have been doing before. The difference is that this gives me less guarantees about the safety and exactly what this function will do. So um, this is why you'll see forms written like this. Um, so it's going to take a little bit of getting used to. I've said to a bunch of people in the class already, C++ is a language that requires some experience and it it is not nice to people who are learning it from scratch. Um, the first couple weeks, couple months that you are diving into it is probably going to be painful in the same way that it's painful to start going to the gym, uh, but it will start paying off and you will start feeling good about it, uh, just like going to the gym, uh, which reminds me I should really go to the gym. Um, but, so, same goes for length, for example. So this length function is going to return the length of this vector, and we want it to guarantee that in returning the length, it never changes this vector. It would be super weird if your length function for some reason changed the length of the vector, right? Like that would be bizarre. This is here to make the compiler enforce that we never make that mistake. Um, normalizing, on the other hand, is intended to change the length. Um, so therefore we don't include this const here because that's what we expect. We expect normalize to transform this vector. Um, same goes with set. When we set it to something new, our intention is to change x and y because we're taking in a new x and a new y and changing these. Set zero, we are setting both of x and y to zero. Um, so in all of these cases, we are doing something to transform the vector. And so lastly, I had mentioned, you know, near the beginning of this, that we have these operator overloads. Um, so the ones that are included in the assignment definition here uh, are those for assignments. So plus equals, minus equals, times equals. Those are the ones that you are most likely going to use uh, when you are assigning to something. There are other operator overloads that I have written in my own solution to this for, um, rather than the assignments, what are known as the binary operators, and they're called binary operators, things like plus, minus, times, divide, where they're called binary operators because they have two operands. There is a left-hand side and a right-hand side, that when I'm adding one plus one, there is a one on the left and there's a one on the right, and I put those two things together, and that's how binary operators work. Toward the end of this, I will discuss a little bit about binary operators. So um, now that I've sort of given a basic rundown, uh, you can see that most of these functions are complaining that function definitions are not found. Um, this is very much akin to when um, we made a change to GD body where we added this new variable and it couldn't find a function definition for this. What this means when you see this green underline and this sort of thing going on is that there is no function definition in your CPP file that reflects what the declaration shows in your .h file here. So again, I mean, I like my copy and paste, and so I, I use it pretty liberally. And so um, I'm going to copy and paste these things in. Um, generally, the way that I go about doing things in here is that I put two spaces between my functions. That is entirely a matter of style. Um, if you would like to do something different, I mean, go ahead and do that. Uh, this is my way of organizing things, but you may have a very different idea about how this stuff should go. So I'm going to drop this stuff in, and you're probably noticing already that um, there's still a lot of green and a lot of red squiggles. Um, and I'm going to touch that in just one second uh, when we start looking at the first one of these. Um, because you'd think that everything is fine now, right? Like we put all this stuff in, so why isn't it, like why isn't it behaving? Well, a bunch of these went away, so that's nice. But 
If I look back into my .h file, sure enough, the green is still there, and sure enough, it still says function definition for gdvec2 not found. What gives? What's going on? Um, you may remember from last time uh, that I pointed out this gdvec2 and scope resolution operator that are attached before the constructor here. The CPP file needs these inserted in order to understand that a given function in the CPP file reflects the one over here. Notice how this gdvec2 now, after adding the scope resolution operator, no longer has a green underline. So let's do that to dot. So I'll put that before the function name, save my file, go over here. Sure enough, dot no longer has this problem. Um, this is a really easy thing to forget, especially when you're a beginner to C++. Um, frankly, it's a pretty easy thing to forget for anybody. Um, it's one of the easiest, simplest slip-ups that you will make, but until you gain enough experience to know very clearly what it means when you get that green underline and the thing is missing, and like be able to narrow that down to the small number of possibilities of what exactly you might have done wrong, um, that's going to confuse you a couple times before that like really hits home. I suppose another thing that I hadn't mentioned last time, and which will have certainly been brought up in your C++ class in the first few weeks, is that um, in C Sharp, you declare functions individually as being public or private or protected or some of those things. In C++, you just put them under a uh, like a group. So all of these things in this class are public. Um, would it be good to make some of them private? Yes, maybe. Um, but for the sake of you know putting a solution together that just you know is a little bit easier to manage. Um, I'm just keeping everything public for now uh, to save myself having to write getters and setters and all of that business. I'll just try and slim down on the amount of work that we actually have to do here. So um, now I'm only going to write a couple of these functions. Um, there's a couple things that I'm going to drop in here uh, in terms of comments in order to make it clear like how you should go about um, doing different things in these functions. But uh, the constructor here, you can see from our parameter list constructor. So this is when, when a function doesn't have any parameters between its parentheses, that function is known as parameter list a lot of the time. So if you hear me say that, that's, that's what's meant. The parameter list constructor is the one that doesn't take any arguments. And so this one that does take two arguments here, so this is the constructor, a second constructor that we can define that allows us to, instead of just creating a vector that's at zero, zero, I can create a vector and also initialize it to some value. So if I'm doing that, um, sure, I can, um, I could do just x is equal to, um, well, I guess in this case it would be something a little bit awkward. I'd need to use this because I named this sort of weirdly. Let's fix that actually. I used new x and new y down here. Uh, yeah, so let's do something like that. So let's put those in there and uh, that will sort of resolve the confusion here. Um, so let's, um, so we could do that. So we have x is equal to new x and y is equal to y. So I mean, we're doing pretty close to the same thing as, uh, as this constructor. Now, here, um, this dot product is kind of an interesting, is kind of an interesting thing. So if you remember, um, we do something like x1 times, you know, x2 plus y1 times y2. Like we, if you recall, we're taking the two x parameters of the vectors and multiplying them together, taking the two y's of the two vectors and multiplying them together, and then we're adding both of those results. So 
um, what's going to come out of this is a scalar value. Um, and for now, I'm just going to say that this returns 0.0. .0. Like that will satisfy the function. But um, I'm going to write this to do in here um, as dot product is equal to this statement so that that'll jog your memory and you can put down the specifics of how this thing is maybe supposed to work. And maybe this thing should be a lowercase v. All the other ones are. Sure. Length. Um, if you recall, um, this is all about Pythagorean theorem. So um, to find the length of a vector, we need to find um, the hypotenuse between its x and its y components. Um, so that means that you're going to square the x and square the y and find the square root of the result. Um, so this is going to be something like um, length is equal to square root of like x times x plus y times y, something along those lines. And I'll say now, hint, include, hint include math at the top uh, for the square root function. Um, so you're going to want to include that up at the top of your file so that you can do something with that. Again, I'm leaving the details to you, but I hope the comments are a pretty good hint about how maybe you want to come at this. Um, so normalizing is um, uh, basically what you're doing is you're taking a vector that may be a length different than one and you are resizing it so that it has a length of exactly one. Um, so this is resize vector to be exactly one unit long. So in order to normalize, I can give you a hint in that you're going to want to be able to get the length. Um, and so, uh, well, conveniently, we have a function for that. So we can just go get the length from this function. And um, divide both x and y by the length to um, resize the vector to one unit length. And for now, uh, that doesn't even need to return anything, in fact, because it is a void return. So I should be saying, um, as we go, actually, from this point on, I, I can bring this up. As I go through these functions, it's important, probably, that we look over what the function signatures of these things are. So if you recall, this statement here about the return type, the function's name, and the parameters that it takes constitute the function's signature or its declaration. Um, and so it's very, very important that you become comfortable with reading these. This is the bread and butter of a programmer's life. And if you can't read these, it's like being a musician who can't read music. Um, so this is a thing that you have to learn or it's going to haunt you forever. Um, so. When you see void here, this means that the function doesn't return anything. And you'll note statements like return.0.0 .0 in length here. Its return type is double. So here I'm saying return 0 back as the floating point number that this was expecting. Right? So we're going to see a few different return types here. And I'll try to bring that up sort of as we go. 
And of course, for these diff for these parameters that this function takes, like set here, it takes a parameter double, which is so it's taking a parameter called new x, which is a double precision floating point number, and new y, which is also a floating point number. And we're going to do something with that. Um, here, I'm actually going to fill this one in because this one's pretty self-explanatory in terms of what it does. This one is pretty straightforward. I think everybody can figure that x is going to get set to new x and y is going to get set to new y. That's no big surprise for anyone, right? So why I'm filling this in is because I want to show you something that will help your coding in general. Coding reuse goes beyond just making classes that we can use for several different objects. Good writing of functions saves you work. You know how I use this length by just calling the length function here to, to get that ready for me to do something with it? Well, do you remember how our constructors both set x and y to different things? Well, we have something to do that already. That's a no-brainer. So instead of using this, I'm going to call set. And then I'm going to do it in the other constructor with our new x and our new y there. Well, why does that matter? Well, if for any reason there's anything that ever changes about setting variables on this, on this um, or setting your x and y values through this function, when you change it here, it will affect everywhere that you're using set. So if you're using set across the board and you're not using a bunch of different ways to accomplish this, the change just takes place everywhere all at once. These are the kinds of ways that you probably want to be thinking about uh, working toward like including in your programming style because they're things that will save you uh, pretty frequently. Um, and actually, uh, well, look at this. Set zero happens to be a very specific version of set that sets to zero, zero. And well, geez, I can even specialize this. Uh, my original constructor up here does that. So I can just call set zero there and that sort of resolves that. And then set zero just calls set and that flows right down to the most basic functionality of setting my x and y variables. So it's at this point that we hit the, um, the fun stuff, the weird stuff, the stuff that's a little bit, uh, a little bit more complex in, um, in how this functions. So um, this is a thing that I'm probably going to have to describe because it's a little bit funky. Um, you're going to look at the contents of this function and you're going to say, that's easy, why did you make a big deal about this? But I promise someday you're going to do operator overloading yourself and you're going to go, wow, this got really airy really fast. So um, turns out uh, this is actually not really a big deal. Um, I'm going to use set here, just like I have been all along. And, well, what would you expect plus equals to do? If I am adding two vectors together, I'm adding their x components and I'm adding their y components. So when I set this, I want to set it to x plus the x of v here and y plus these y and why is it complaining at me it's always fun times when from time to time visual studio will just flake out and give you a fake error um, as you build up your experience, you'll get a, a gut feeling for, for when um, maybe Visual Studio is pulling your chain. Uh, and that was one of those times. So here we can see we're using set once again because we are ultimately, at the end of the day, an assignment is setting the value of this vector and we are adding another vector to it. 
So we're taking the x that we have and we're adding the x of this vector that we're bringing in to our x currently. And we're doing the same thing with y. So this is going to result in the value of v being added to this vector. And so then we're going to do the same thing but for minus. So in this case, we are subtracting from the current value, and that's easy. Um, you can just take v dot x away from x and subtract v dot y from y. Simple, basically same deal. So you're gonna notice that times equals does not feature another vector being passed in here. Multiplying a vector by another vector is an operation that doesn't really make any sense. Um, so you won't see that. That's probably most akin to dot product, but multiplying two vectors together isn't really a thing that you'll ever see be done. So um, in this case, um, again, we're going to use set. We're still using set, but this one is even more straightforward than the one before. Value of x times a, value of y times a. All we're doing is multiplying our vector by some scalar value. So if we had a vector that had a length of two, or maybe, no, let's think of it as its components. Let's say we had x is equal to one and y is equal to two, and a coefficient of three comes in. So our x is one times three becomes three, and our y is 2 times 3 becomes 6. So uh, that's all that's happening here. And then the last one of these operators is tricky. It's a little bit different than these other ones because it has a return type. Negating this is sub subtly different than these other operations in that you have to return a value from this. Um, so what I'm doing here is I am going to return and this is going to look funky, but let's go for it. GDVec2 minus x minus y. So I am creating a new gdvec2 and I am passing the whole object back to the caller. This is not passing a pointer to the object, it's not passing a reference to it in memory, it is literally passing the whole thing. Um, again, you're going to run into this when you start talking about memory management pointers and references in a few weeks. For now, um, accept this as a matter of fact because it is just sort of gross um so i'm really leaving you here with only a few small pieces that really need to be filled in in terms of this vector and believe me there's plenty more functions that you could go on to write here that will make this bigger and badder and just totally awesome uh, i've written vector classes before um, that have been very, very full featured, and there's a lot that you can do with it um, way beyond what's in here. This is the bare bones minimum if you want to have something that's useful, um, but you can do a lot more. So, um, from where we're at here, I'm gonna go a slight bit further and I'm gonna jump into um, this GD body. So, we have a couple functions for GD body that we need to add as well. So we have a fancier constructor, we have an update, and we have this apply force to center. So these are the, the things that we're, we're focusing on here. So um, I'm just gonna, as before, spend a little bit of time just making things a tiny bit prettier. Um, get everything lined up. Um, at the risk of making somebody a tiny bit angry, I'm going to move this double for mass to the beginning here because my other GD body uses mass as the first argument and it would be weird and inconsistent for the other one to not do that. Um, so I'm gonna 
I'm gonna go with that. I'm, I'm just gonna make this consistent throughout. I'm gonna refer to the velocity just as velocity. There's, I think, no good reason to refer to it as linear velocity, uh, while that is true. And of course, you can see that, um, oh, that's funny. It was written in the assignment sheet as um, B2Vec2 is what you find in Box2D. Um, I suspect that that just got forgotten when we were writing the assignment. I'm just going to turn that to G2, GDVec2 to be consistent with the rest of what we're writing here. So, um, okay, so we have a couple new functions added in here. And as before, we have some green underlying, but that's not too big of a deal. There's not a whole lot that we have to worry about there. So we're just going to take these functions and I'm going to copy these into the GD body CPP. And um, so like I did before, I'm going to put a couple lines between each of these, uh, give them their curly braces so that they're ready to be written into. Um, all right, so um, as before, we've got some weirdness here, expecting an identifier, expected a, you know, a semicolon, like these are weird things, right? Um, so as I mentioned before, it's this scope resolution operator. This, this thing can play havoc with your mind when you don't know to expect it or you're, you're forgetting it and you don't know, um, to remember it. So, um... I'm really emphasizing that so that you can learn to remember that and not get hung up on that one because it is a little bit difficult to figure out what's going wrong when your syntax is technically pretty much spot on. Like everything, like you may have written all of these functions perfectly well and the only thing you're missing is this little chunk at the beginning and it's very easy to forget that and it can just make you very mad. Um, so uh, now that we have that up and working, so we got three functions in here that need a little bit of work. Um, so, um, now I'm going to start from this constructor. So we have another simpler constructor where we're just setting the mass. We already know how to do that. So let's just do that. Easy. Um, then we have these that take a new position, new velocity, and a new acceleration. Now, we can simply... work like this. We'll just... You'll notice when I'm coding that I copy and paste and change things uh, probably about as frequently as I actually assign new things. Um, that's a habit of mine. Um, whether that works for you or doesn't I think is a matter of opinion, but I do it a lot. So anyway, all right, so I just filled out this second constructor because this is this is pretty straightforward fair. I don't think that what this does is any surprise to anyone. This is really this update and this apply force to center function. These are the big ones. So update position and velocity using equations of motion. So this is where you're going to be using the time step or the, the delta time. So this is how long has gone by since the last time that we, or how long has gone by in our simulation um, since the last time that this body moved? Um, so, you know, therefore, how much time do we need to simulate motion for? Um, so this involves a little bit of work where we're going to do a couple things. So I'm going to jam a couple of to-dos in here to pay attention to. So one is you're going to need to update the velocity from the acceleration. So that's kind of your first thing. You've got, um, you are going to be updating velocity from acceleration uh, times time step. And then once you have updated your velocity, you can then update your position. So that's kind of step two. So you're updating position from 
velocity times time step. And those are sort of the big items for, for update. And there's one other thing that I'm going to discuss, but I'm going to come back to it in just a little bit. This apply force to center, this could just as well be called apply force because um, in this course we aren't discussing the effects of rotations or like generally forces acting um, on an object uh, not from its center, but um, it's technically the most correct thing to say apply force to center. So what we're what we're doing here is that we are taking in a vector for the force that's being applied and we want to use the mass of this object to determine how much acceleration changes by. So we're using this acceleration variable to sort of hold on to um, to hold on to the acceleration that has been produced by forces that have been applied to the object each frame. So that's going to mean then that we do something like acceleration plus equals um, force divided by mass because if you recall F is equal to MA, which also means that A is equal to F over M. But notice that that does not compile. Remember when I mentioned those binary um, operator overloads? There is a different way to get at this. Um, and I'll show you what it looks like to use if we are just sticking with these operator overloads for assignments we can do this it's just a little bit more convoluted this is the line of code that we'd all like to write I'm assuming but we may get something a little bit more uh, like this do that to let's call it temp um, and so we're going to assign temp to be the force that's coming in. And then we're going to need to take temp and um, multiply it by 1 over the mass. And then we can set the acceleration equal or pardon me, add to the acceleration temp. So this is a very convoluted way of coming around to this. I can improve this a tiny bit if I go back to this line in particular is a really com complicated one, right? It's very weird that I am multiplying temp by one over the mass and assigning it back to temp. Well, what a weird thing to do, right? Um, so we, we can actually add another operator overload here for divide equals that would maybe resolve this issue. So I'm gonna do that because, well, why not? Like if it's a real operation that we might actually run into. Um, so, all right, so I'm gonna add this in. And then I'm going to go, so this is in GDVec2, by the way. So if I go to my GDVec2 CPP, I can simply copy my multiply function here. And I'm simply going to say divide x by a and divide y by a. That's, oh, and make sure to change the name of the function. So in the case of multiply equals, I'm multiplying both x and y by a. In the case of divide equals, I am dividing both x and y by a. So I could clean this up slightly, right? Like this would at least let me say temp divide equals by mass. So that's a little better, but still this three lines um, is a little bit harder to understand than what, that what this is here. You want to, as a programmer, generally try to push toward readable code, understandable code. 
um, code that expresses very well, even when, like, with minimal comments, what it is that it's doing. And it's a lot easier to tell what this line is getting at and what it's trying to do than what these three lines above it are doing. So, um, I will show here how we can go about overloading the binary operators to make it so that we can just simply say force divided by mass. So vector divided by scalar. Um, so I will show how to do that. And um, it's not super hard, but it's a little bit tricky. Um, and it's going to involve some syntax that you're simply not going to understand for a little bit. I just want to be able to give this to you so that you have the ability to write a vector class that behaves more or less like you would hope it to, uh, or that you would kind of expect it to. So I'm just going to write this one thing in here, um, maybe going to add another one. Uh, so I've just copied this in from a separate file, and you're going to notice for those of you who are uh, very observant, uh, I've been talking about how h-files are where you declare things this whole time. Well, um, like many things in C++, the rule only goes so far. Um, because of this friend keyword that shows up here, uh, which I am not going to explain for the time being, it is not possible to define this function in the CPP. So it just simply has to be defined where it is. Um, that's pretty weird, and you will get full agreement from me that that's pretty weird, but that's how it is, and uh, if you want to define a binary operator, this is what this looks like. So now that I've put this in place, if we go back to gdbody.cpp and take a look at this acceleration line, this should behave for us, sure enough. So I'm going to comment out these three lines that I put in here to sort of show how that works. But now we have this lovely statement, acceleration plus equals force over mass. Looks great, right? Who could complain? It looks fantastic. Um, now, this update here um, is something that probably lots of you are pretty uh, pretty familiar with doing. Um, this is this thing that you find in your typical game loop where you're taking your velocity and turning it into position. Um, and I wanted to come back to this because it's a fairly important thing to recognize that there is a little bit of a weird kink here. You notice how this apply force to center function um, is adding to acceleration? Well, this is only like this should only last for one frame. Each time we update, we need to clear the acceleration um, so that it doesn't just keep going up and up and up forever as we add more and more force over time. The force that gets applied one frame uh, should really only last for that one frame and then be over. Um, and then if you want more force, you just apply force on the next frame. So I'm going to make sure to add in here one further statement to do um, reset acceleration back to zero. And um, looking over the functions that are available in GDVec2, um, it should be fairly clear what which one of these methods you could use to do that. So uh, that should give you a pretty good idea how to proceed here for these functions. And uh, that gives you a pretty, pretty nice feeling uh, operator overload for dealing with acceleration here. Um, while I'm at it, I'm gonna be nice. No, I'm not gonna be nice. You can figure out how to do the multiply one yourself. I'm going to shove it in there, but I'm not going to, I'm going to write it for you. It's lazy. Um, yeah, sure. So this is just empty for now. Let's, I don't know, zero, zero.
So, oops, times. Oh, the fun catch is that with multiply, you gotta do it both ways. Because it's possible that you could have the, the double on one side or the other side. So, fair warning. Anyway, there you go. So there's your things for those. If you want to figure out plus and minus for those as well, please go ahead and do it. Um, I'm sure that you can Google pretty good stuff about how to do that as well. Uh, yeah. So um, that sort of brings us back. I've been running on for quite a long time now. This has been a fairly long uh, session. I'm coming up. 50 minutes now? Yeah, it's pretty long. So I'm going to uh, just take a quick look at this main and uh, maybe give you some pointers on how you might want to approach um, sort of putting together the loop that you need to have in order to work out um, this simulation throughout. So I mean, it kind of consists of a couple, a couple of important parts, right? Um, writing this table header out, um, there's a pretty good chance that that is something that's definitely happening right at the beginning. Uh, that makes a ton of sense to me, and uh, yeah. So I'm gonna say these table headers being written together, uh, that that makes like tons of sense to me. So I'm just gonna sort of pile these things together. Um, write the table header. And I'm gonna lump these things together. I guess I should put them in the order that I had them. So I'll put the console first and that thing after. Uh, so this is going to be write a row of the table. So these are these things are sort of lumped together as those. And at the end, we're going to have to finish this. So we're going to have somewhere, you're probably going to have some kind of loop that goes on here. And that loop will uh, probably end somewhere around here. So... The things that are happening inside there are going to be the things that go on over and over and over again. Um, so there's going to be a few pieces to this. And in exactly what order, um, that really comes down to exactly how your logic is written. Um, So this thing is going to end when the jet ski comes to a stop. Um, yeah. Uh, so we know for sure that we're only going to be stopping after, you know, after the 10 second point at some point, because we start slowing down at 10 seconds. So that's probably when that's going to happen. Um, and other things that might need to happen inside this loop would be things like, um, you know, increment the time by one step. Um, let's throw those to-dos in. See these in programming land a lot. Um, and so we'd be incrementing and we'd be, you know, um, apply the correct force to the, uh, apply the correct force to the jet ski based on time and update the jet ski body. And, um, yeah, there you go. 
All right, well, I think that's about as much detail as I'm willing to give. Um, so our future live coding sessions will probably not be so directly instructive to exactly what you need to do in order to build out your assignment. But I wanted to make sure that uh, I was able to sort of run you through the basic skills that you needed um, and some of the like basic syntactic things that might sort of screw you up when you're just sort of really getting started with C++ because many of you probably only have very limited experience with C++ right now and so that shouldn't be a reason for you to have a really hard time. So anyhow, um, I've rambled on for plenty long enough and I'm pretty sure you guys are probably plenty tired of listening to me so uh, for now, that'll be it. Um, anyway, good luck with the remainder of your assignment, and uh, I'll see you next week.